art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Many thanks to the choir. Uh, they uh, have a practice on Wednesday evening and uh, had a practice before the service and appreciate it. Appreciate it to make this worship service more rich and abundant and beautiful. Thank you. It is time for us to rise after, for the scripture reading. It is James chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Uh, we're going to read this responsibly. Let me go first and your turn and my turn. Don't read my part, okay? <laughs> James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greeted. Whenever you face trials, many. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So that you may be mature and complete, not lack anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives gener generously to all without finding fault. and it will be given to you. You believe and know us, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. are going through the middle of summer, hot and humid Alabama summer. I've been thinking that I want to choose one book of the Bible and preach on it during the summer like a, something similar to a Bible study style because the children have VBS and young adults and youth can do a retreat, something like that. But what about Adults. So I would like our church to immerse into the word of God sentence by sentence, okay, word by word and verse by verse for helping grow spiritually during the summertime. So I chose the book of James for several reasons. Are you ready? <laughs> ready! The book of James is a letter written by a man named James. The problem is there are several Jameses in the New Testament. That is the only problem. So what kind of James is this? Anyone knows? I can't hear you. Okay. Let me go. But... Pretty reliable church tradition, tradition assigns this book to the one who's often known as James the Just, who was the half-brother of Jesus. What is half-brother? Why? They have the same mother, but <laughs> Jesus had no father, heavenly father. So it is called the half-brother. So this James was the early leader of the ancient church in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15 especially point out how this James was sort of the leader or header, head of the church council in Jerusalem. This letter, James, is sort of wonderful, unique in the New Testament because of the emphasis on its practical Christian living. The book of James certainly has its, its own character and style. It is very straightforward, direct. Many of its statements are given in a very pregnant and meaningful terms where you can find the practical wisdom for you. And that challenges the reader to live in a godly way. The letter of James seems to have been written at a time when the church was still predominantly Jewish. In its character, 
In other words, Gentile believers had not yet started coming into the church yet in great number. Okay? And by the time that the book of James was written, we see indication of this right in the first verse. Let me read this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to notice two things here. First, even though we believe this James to be the apostle to the Jewish people at the time, he doesn't introduce himself as an apostle and even not as a half-brother of Jesus. For James, the title he would like to cling to is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might miss a great point of how fascinating this title is. During the days of Jesus' ministry on earth, his half-brothers and sisters in hometown Nazareth did not seem to believe in him or follow him. They questioned Jesus' sanity. Are you insane? You are the Messiah? Or they were not fully supportive of his messiahship and his mission yet at the time until James received a special resurrection appearance of Jesus. What am I talking about? Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 records that after that Jesus was seen by James, then by all the apostles. The name of Jesus, uh, James, is mentioned by Paul here. Jesus was seen by James. After this, James began to believe upon him in a mighty way. Okay? Does it make sense? Moreover, according to an early church history, James was a, such a devoted man of prayer that his knees had large and thick calluses so much so that his knees looked like the knees of a camel. Okay? Man of prayer. In addition, while James was martyred or stoned to death in Jerusalem, he was praying for those who attacked him. And this man, this James, was a man of God who believed in Jesus as his Lord and Messiah with great devotion, and he was truly servant of God. Okay? So take a look at the verse again. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please remember that James was a Jew from a Hellenistic, Hellenistic background. The Greek word for the Lord here is curious. Curious is even used here with the, the article, the Lord Jesus Christ, which was a grammatical formulation that was used for God only. So, so that means James considered Jesus to be God, okay? who was a half-brother of Jesus, who was not fully supportive of Jesus' ministry, now confess that Jesus is God. This, is, this is, is what the first line of the verse 1 means. And the second part, servant, its Greek word is doulos. And it perhaps simply better translated just a slave who is in a permanent state of devotion to another person. So in the context of the verse 1, it means that James considered Jesus to be God and considered himself to be permanently devoted to Jesus. Are you with me? So, look at the first line of verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about you? Is, is it the title that you want to cling to? So put your name in the place of James and read this together, okay? Put your name in the place of James, a servant of God and of the Lord. Let us read this part again. Ready? Go, Johan, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, 
And then in the second line of, of verse 1, James continues to greet to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad now. There's no doubt that he is referring to all the Christian believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to the Jewish believers. Because James seemed to write this letter before Gentile believers came into the church in great number yet, and it was written for the Christians in the world at that time. Therefore, we could say that this is a letter for us, for contemporary Christians today as well. Now we get to the verse 2. Read this with me. Ready? Go. Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, what a beginning. I mean, after that greeting in verse 1, James is getting into it right away. James seemed to regard it as inevitable that you and I as Christians would have trials. Have trials. The idea of trial here means a testing. Means what? A testing where your patience and faith will be stretched when you fall into many kinds of trials. There are seasons in our life when it seems to be one trial, one testing, one challenge after another, after another, and another. Now James says, in, in those seasons, what should they do? Consider it pure joy. In other words, we Christians greet Embrace, even welcome these trials as the things that God will use, as the things that God will bless, as the things that God will work through in the midst of our Christian life. We do not have to have a sour, pessimistic perspective about our life, feeling, oh, why me? Why this? It's a problem after another. The scripture says, will face trials of many kinds, and God has a blessing for us in the midst of them. What kind of blessing is it? In verse 3, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, I love that word that's, that's translated perseverance here. It is the ancient Greek word, hupomone. This word doesn't mean a passive waiting, just like a patient waiting for their turn in a waiting room at a hospital. Boring, right? Instead, it is the quality that helps you to finish a marathon. Okay? It's active endurance. It comes from two ancient Greek words. First, hupo means under, mune which means to stay, abide, or remain. So perseverance or hupomone means basically to choose to remain under a heavy load. Okay? Why would you do it? Why would you do it? Because you know, again, verse 3, the testing of your face produces what? Perseverance. I want you to notice something here. It says that faith is tested through trials, but it doesn't say that faith is produced by trial. Are you with me? Do you see the difference? Again, listen carefully. <laughs> Stay awake. Okay? Faith is tested through trial, but it doesn't say that faith is produced, produced by trials. Okay? How is faith fundamentally produced? According to chapter, uh, book of Romans chapter 10, read this with me. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Supernaturally, faith into, is built into us as we hear, as we understand, as we trust in the word of God, Right? Here's the thing. I don't know how much faith I have. Do you know how much faith you have? We cannot measure it. But my reaction, your reaction under the trial exposes how much faith I have. Right? 
Again, faith is tested in the trial. It is not necessarily produced in the trial. So the bottom line is, if the trial or difficulties, suffering, come my way, I choose to receive them with unbelief, with grumbling, then the trial can produce bitterness. Then the trial can produce discouragement in our lives. That's why James challenges us to count it all joy when you fall into many kinds of trial. Now, in verse 4, James goes on to explain. Let's read this together. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lack anything. Perseverance is the mark of the person who is mature, complete, and lacking in nothing. One commentator said that these exp expressions came from the Greek Olympic Games, okay, or their athletic context. The man was regarded perfect at the time if he gained the victory in the pentathlon of five different exercises in the Olymp Olympic Games. That's possibly where the idea of verse 4 here came from. But the thing is that we don't long for trials. But when we see the strength of God come through the trials in our lives, we can say, well, Lord, this is difficult. This sucks. This is too bad. I don't know how I'm going to make it through, but I'm going to consider it pure joy and I'm going to be joyful in that trial. As you promised, you did something wonderful in my past through the trial because I saw your strength. I saw your provision. I saw your goodness in the land of the living. Even though it was difficult, even though it sucks, even though I thought that this trial might crush me. But you showed yourself faithful. That's a wonderful place for the believer to be. Now, starting at verse 5, James is going to speak about how we can receive the wisdom that we need from God in the trial. Ready for this? Read verse 5 with me one more time. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. I don't know about you, but when I'm in the midst of a trial, I need God's wisdom. Do you? One of the greatest examples of the wisdom that we need to know in a time of trial is like this. Lord, is this something that you want to remove from me? Or, is this something through which you want to give me strength in the midst of my life? I think that's a very important aspect of wisdom you see in the midst of your trial. Problems, challenges. Someone once said that knowledge is the ability to take things apart. Okay, with the knowledge we analyze and take things apart, but wisdom, that's the ability to put things back together, right? So when our life is falling apart, we need God's wisdom to know how and what we can do to help things hang together, right? We need God's wisdom. So how should we ask? James says in verse 6, read this with me one more time. But when you ask, you must believe and no doubt because the one who doubts is a, like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. You know what? So often in our time of trial, we are so willing to go to anybody except to God. You know? Hey, 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 I need your help. I need your prayer. And hey, I'm scared to death except to God. 
sometimes. We need to ask God for wisdom. And the fundamental way that God speaks to us is through the Word of God, the Bible. I believe that there are times when God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit in a special way. I believe what Jesus says that his sheep hear his voice. But when you seek God's wisdom, the place to begin, the place to end should be the Bible. And the true wisdom will always be consistent with the Bible. Notice this in verse 6. When you ask God for wisdom, you need to ask in faith without doubting two things. Doubting God's desire to give and His ability to give. Without doubting God's desire and His ability to give us the wisdom. Now, you can use this as a foundation and as a promise that God wants you to ask for wisdom. Right? He's not bothered by your asking. I like to pray for other people according to the promises of God. I've been using the promises described in Isaiah chapter 41, 43, and Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, something like that. God, you promised us! And we know that you are faithful to keep your promises. If you want your prayers answered, please pray to God with the promises in the Bible. And get yourself into God's word. Through his word and through the Holy Spirit, God will reveal his wisdom to you. But you need to come to God in faith without doubting. His desire and his ability to give you the wisdom. According to verse 6, those who doubt are like a wave over the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. I think that's, that a wave of sea, the sea is an appropriate description of someone who is hindered by unbelief, by unnecessary doubt. Why? A wave over the sea is without rest. Without rest. Do you know that kind of person? Have you been there? I know this kind of a person. Me, <laughs> sometimes. And then, um, three weeks, weeks ago for my vacation, I went to Cocoa Beach in Florida which is famous for what? Surfing. Strong waves. And Ezra and I and my wife, Jenny, just um, too brave to fight the waves, strong waves, and exhausting, hurting. <laughs> it was just painful. Oh, after spending one hour, no mass, no more. It is very hard. Because restless, no peace there, confusing, you know, unrest. Sometimes the waves are bigger and sometimes are smaller. But the thing is, there's always some kind of action. A wave of the sea is capable of great destruction. And so is the doubter. We don't want to be like the waves of the sea in our spiritual journey. Are you? In that sense, we want to be formed in our faith that we have a loving God who will answer our prayers when we come to Him and ask for wisdom. Notice that verse 7 depicts the doubter as double-minded and unstable. If you are dieting, your behavior, your Actions, your thoughts are unstable, right? The Greek word for a double-minded is dipsuktos, meaning a person with two minds or souls. A double-minded person is restless and confused in his thought, 
thoughts and actions and behavior. Such a person is always in conflict with himself and can never ever lean with confidence on God and His gracious promises. Oh, I need God's wisdom, but I'm not sure. Unstable, restless, confused. No peace at all. Verse 7 says that this person should not expect to receive anything from God. That is all alarming, right? So, brothers and sisters, now I'm finishing my sermon. That is good news. Listen, what kind of trials are you going through nowadays? Whenever I heard something painful from our church families, my heart breaks as well. The Bible says we face many, many kinds of trials in our lives. It is inevitable. While preparing this sermon, I was reminded of many of you and prayed for you. Prayed for those who are going through a very tough season of life with medical issues and cure. I encourage you to choose to believe to the best of your ability. Pray God to help you put away the doubts and unbelief and the remnant of the double-mindedness. And say, listen, Lord, you are such a good God who has promised to bring me wisdom. Thank you for your word in the book of James today. But I don't know how you're going to bring me the wisdom, but I'm going to read your word, meditate it on, upon my heart, and keep my heart and my ear open, open for the voice of your spirit. Lord, I believe that you will bring to me the wisdom that I need. This suffering, this challenge, this trial. With that wisdom from God, you will be able, you will be empowered to go through this trial in your life. There is a promise of God. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you rise as we sing together? As we sing together two songs, just make sure that your focus will be on our Savior, the Messiah, who heals, who knows, who provides. Let us sing together. You are my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Oh, seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all.
I worship you. to do that by the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit every day. Father, teach us with the word of God every day. Help us to be guided by the Spirit and the reason that we exist for this, to live for you, God. As we dismiss, may the peace of God, the Father, the grace of Jesus the Son, the guidance and help and communion of the Spirit be now and forever. Amen.